It depends on the type of bacteria, and really refrigeration and freezing actually just slows down bacteria. And depending on the conditions that it's in and how much has grown, if it's there, once you go to reheat it, you still may not be able to kill it all. September is National Food Safety Education Month, a perfect time to remind busy families about the importance of food safety and the steps they can take to reduce the risk of foodborne illness. On today's Sound Living, some easy-to-follow food safety tips to help prevent food poisoning and keep food safe. Sound Living is a weekly public affairs program produced by Research and Extension at Kansas State University. I'm Jeff Wickman. Karen Blakeslee, a K-State Research and Extension food scientist and coordinator of the Rapid Response Center and Extension Agent Resource for Food Science, says there are several steps we can take at home and at the grocery store to prevent illness-causing bacteria from spreading to our food and families. According to Karen, Food Safety Month provides an opportunity to remind folks about some of the things we talk about regarding food safety, as well as separate fact from fiction as to which food practices are actually safe and which ones we may think are safe but really aren't. The first step in reducing the risk of foodborne illness is keeping everything clean. Blakesley says that begins with properly washing hands and utensils. Absolutely. That is probably... One of the most important things you can do when you walk in your kitchen and you're thinking about making supper or whatever meal it is, always wash your hands first. Give them a good scrub. And the 20 seconds that it takes is real easy to do. So be sure to make it a habit. It doesn't have to be the antibacterial soap. The experts out there say that just plain old soap works very well. What really is important is scrubbing and rubbing your hands together. That friction that you create by rubbing your hands together is really what loosens the dirt and gets it off your hands. So that's really the best thing to do. You also want to make sure that you're keeping things around there clean. I know a lot of things that people forget about are those dish towels that seem to just stay hung up all year round. Yeah, you need to wash those often. You know, once you get a dirty towel, put it in the washing machine. If you're still using a sponge to wash your dishes, those are really not the best thing to be using because they can really trap bacteria and they'll stay there until you put water on your sponge again and then they're going to come alive again. So sponges are really kind of frightening, actually. (laughs) So it's better to use something that's easily washable that you can wash frequently in uh, good hot soapy water. So this could be just a what we would consider a dishcloth? Yeah, a dishcloth. And then, of course, using clean dish towels to dry your hands or your dishes. And actually, if, if you're hand washing your dishes, it's actually better to let your dishes air dry so that you eliminate one more chance of a dirty towel touching your clean dishes. What about in terms of just things around the kitchen, the blender that maybe sits on the counter, the toaster that's on the counter, the coffee pot that's on the counter? What should we do there? Yeah, absolutely. You know, give your kitchen a good cleaning. I myself cleaned my refrigerator the other night. Take everything out. Take out the drawers. Take out what you can. Wash them in warm, soapy water. Then let them dry well and then put them back in the refrigerator. Around your cabinets, you know, you always got crumbs everywhere. Have you looked underneath your toaster lately? It's kind of surprising what might be under there. (laughs) So if you got crumbs and things like that hiding, that can invite pests, and you don't want critters crawling around on your cabinets. So every once in a while, if nothing else, at least once a month on the cabinets and the countertops in, you know, where your toaster is, lift them up, move them, clean underneath them and get those crumbs out of the way. You mentioned the inside of the refrigerator, and that's an important area to keep clean, simply because if you do it at least once a month, you're going to find all the old food that maybe got shoved to the back. Absolutely. That's a good way to find what's in there and rotate those things out. Check the dates on them, especially the perishable type products. Those would be like your dairy products and the eggs and things like that. Check the dates on those. The things that are like your condiments, like ketchup, mustard, pickles, those can last quite a while, actually, in your refrigerator. But, you know, if you see any spills between your good regular cleanings, if you spill anything in there, always a good idea to clean those up so that you keep things nice and clean and prevent anything to grow in there. Also, we talk a lot about the separate, don't cross, contaminate. We think of that a lot in terms of 
chicken and other types of meats. But this really goes beyond that, doesn't it? Yeah, it's, you know, things like keeping your equipment clean, using a different knife. If you're cutting up chicken for one thing, use a different knife to cut up your salad ingredients, things like that. But your hands can really contaminate, cross-contamination of things. If you are handling raw meats and then don't wash your hands in between that and handling a salad, then you're going to possibly cause a problem. So it's real easy to keep things separated. Another thing that's not recommended anymore is washing your meat before you cook it. There's really no need to do that. What you're asking for by doing that is splattering meat juices on your countertops. And then you may forget to clean your countertops right away. So skip that step. It doesn't need to be done. And you also want to think about these same principles when you're doing your grocery shopping and when you get home when you're putting things away. Absolutely. You know, grocery carts have two or three areas where you can put your grocery items that you're buying. So if you're buying raw meats and chicken and things like that, put those on the bottom and then put the other stuff on top, and that will help keep things separated. And then when it comes to bagging them, you know, watch your baggers, how they're putting things in in the sacks. So if you got raw meat, make sure they're keeping those separated from your other foods. And I know that the chickens and things all come wrapped from the store, but they've got the bags there. So if you feel like double bagging it, that's not a bad idea. Absolutely. You know, most grocery stores do offer the little produce plastic bags. If you're going by the produce section first, grab a couple extra just in case. You never know when they might be out. But that's always a good idea to put your raw meats in an extra plastic bag just to have another barrier. You mentioned keeping it on the bottom of the grocery cart. Maybe a good idea for the refrigeration as well of certain things to put them lower because if they start dripping down, they're going to hit every shelf in between? Absolutely, yes. And that's the principle behind good storage practices in your refrigerator. If you're thawing meats, put them on some kind of a platter or dish and then put them on the bottom shelf just in case an accidental drip happens. And then those drippings won't fall down into the drawers that are underneath there. So yeah, bottom shelf for your raw meats and then everything else above that. When we get to the cooking process, we always talk about cooking to the correct temperature. Maybe let's just run through that if we could, some of the basic meats especially that people deal with. There's really three basic temperatures to remember. 165 is for all poultry-type products, whether it's ground or chicken breast or even a whole turkey. For any other ground meats like ground beef, ground pork, ground lamb, you want to get those patties up to 160. And then the other temperature is 145, and those are for your solid cuts of meat, like your roasts and steaks and things like that. That's a optimum temperature for those products. So there's not as many temperatures that you have to remember anymore. It's really three. And using a thermometer is the only way you know you're getting that temperature. And actually, that thermometer serves a dual purpose, not just to make sure you're getting that temperature, but it helps prevent you from overcooking your meat. Once it gets up to that temperature, it only needs to stay there for about 15 seconds. That's all it needs. So wait a minute. You know, that would be an extra assurance. And then you're done. Your meat's going to continue once you take it off the grill or out of the oven. That temperature is going to rise just a little bit more yet. So let your meat rest before you cut it open. And that's for quality reasons, too. It helps keep your meats juicy, too. What about if you're making a homemade soup? Is there a certain temperature for that? depends on what kind of meat you're using. Most often when you're making soups, you're cooking the meat first. So make sure those meats get to the proper temperatures. And then for cooking the soups, at least you want to get them up to over 140 for sure. And then, you know, if it gets a little hotter than that, that's even better. What you want to do is keep your foods out of that temperature danger zone, which is what we define as 40 degrees to 140 degrees. That temperature range is where bacteria really like to grow. So keep your hot foods hot, cold foods cold. I would imagine with all the use of the microwaves now, thermometers may be even more important there because just the variance between one microwave to another. Absolutely. And just inside a microwave, there's hot spots in there. Rotating your foods is very important to get even cooking. Stopping halfway through and if it's possible to stir the food 
that will help even out the heating process. And then, of course, using a thermometer and then making sure it's getting to the temperature you need. The other part we talk about is safely storing prepared foods. When it comes to chilling foods, we want to be prompt for the most part. Yeah, you want to get your hot foods, once you're done eating, if you have leftovers, you want to get them in the refrigerator. If you have a large amount, say a big pot of soup left, divide it into smaller containers so that it cools off a lot faster in your refrigerator. Go ahead and divide it up into portions that you're probably going to eat, maybe for leftovers for the next day. And they'll chill in your refrigerator a whole lot faster. A couple other ways you can chill your food down is to use an ice water bath in a big tub or even in your sink. Fill it with ice water and put the pot inside of there. Stir it every once in a while. Make sure that the cooling is happening pretty quickly. We like to encourage everybody to use the two-hour rule. If it's still hot outside and you're tailgating, if it's still above 90 degrees, you want to use the one-hour rule and get those things into the ice chest, or if you happen to be close to home yet, put them in the refrigerator. We're really trying to keep that bacteria from spreading. I guess the question is, if you don't do that and you then refrigerate it, the bacteria will grow slowly, but it will still grow. It could. And some bacteria like to grow in cold temperatures. For example, listeria is one of those. So you don't want to give it any opportunity any more than it could possibly have. So the faster you chill it, the better. One of those myths that we were talking about earlier is the fact that just because something has been refrigerated doesn't mean you can kill the bacteria by reheating it. That's right. It depends on the type of bacteria. And really, refrigeration and freezing actually just slows down bacteria. So it could still be there. And depending on the conditions that it's in and how much has grown, if it's there, once you go to reheat it, you still may not be able to kill it all. That's why all of these things work hand in hand. Washing your hands, using your thermometers, making sure you're getting things cooked up to the right temperature, and then chilling promptly, you know, doing it as quickly as you can. All of those things play an important role to make sure that your food is safe. Another one of those things that people think is okay to do is to thaw meat on the counter or in the sink. Oh, yes. Yeah, that one just kind of scares me. (laughs) And you're just asking for bacteria to grow by doing that because uh, you're leaving it out at a temperature that bacteria really like to grow at. You know, it's usually room temperature, which is around 70 degrees. So the outside of your meats are going to warm up faster than the inside. So... If there's something on the outside, it's probably going to start growing, even though it'd still be cold on the inside. So always thaw in the refrigerator, plan ahead. If you're running short of time, use your microwave to start the thawing process, but then continue to cook whatever it is that you're thawing out. One of those other myths deals with leftovers. Safe to eat as long as they don't smell. Yeah, that's not a good one (laughs) at all. That is definitely a myth. If they're starting to smell you've got some serious bacteria growing there. And even if it doesn't smell, you know, leftovers should really be used within one to two days. If you don't think you're going to get them used in that time, freeze them for later use. You know, these foods have already been cooked once, they've been chilled once, they've already been handled. You know, who knows what else has happened. So the sooner you use leftovers, the better. Bottom line, Start clean, stay clean, use that thermometer, and get stuff into the refrigerator or freezer as quickly as you can. Absolutely. Be smart about all of this. It's real easy things. It's not that hard to think about it. And even though September is Food Safety Education Month, and these are reminders for you during this month, these are things you should be doing all year long. That's Karen Blakesley, a K-State Research and Extension Food Scientist and the coordinator of the Rapid Response Center, an extension agent resource for food science. More information on National Food Safety Education Month is available on the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention website, cdc.gov slash food safety. If you have food safety questions, contact the county or district extension office in your area or visit the Extension website, www.ksre.ksu.edu. Sound Living is a weekly public affairs program produced by Research and Extension at Kansas State University. I'm Jeff Wickman, and this is the K-State Radio Network.